y'all were my family. Already, like that's the first one. Like, I don't have anyone to lean on, and you and Dorothy. The following may contain references to anxiety, depression, self harm, and other struggles. Viewer discretion is advised. My name is Jolene, and you can call me Jojo, like my friend does. I am 28 this year. Graduated in 2017 from NUS Law. I'm a lawyer in a US technology company and we've known each other for many, many years. Hi, I'm Gerald. I'm 29 this year. I run my own law firm. Gosh, I can say that now. Um, and I've known Jolene for, uh, since law school. And since then, we've been the close, she's been the closest friend that uh, yeah, I've had um, since I've graduated from school. How to wear? Ah. <laughs> How did you two meet? What was your first impression of each other? We met through uh, our criminal law um, seminar, I remember, under Professor Walter Wood. <laughs> um, but I think we really only got to know each other much closer when we were doing the Innocence Project. My first impression of him in year one was that he's very square, as in, he's very straight laced. He answers questions in a very like, so professor, tell me all. So that, that was my first impression of him. Yeah, huh, you say all these nice things about me, ah? I said, yeah, the kind of say like, but professor, isn't it the case that, <laughs> can I clarify professor, class participation? Oh gosh. That was my first impression, unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> To the best of your ability, describe your mental health journey or conditions in three minutes. I've never had any diagnosed uh, mental condition, but I remember for a large part of my life, I felt very stuck mentally. <clears throat> I was not able to move ahead. And for the longest time, I couldn't figure out why. Until finally, uh, and until finally, Julie and I started to talk about this idea of therapy. I used to have this notion also that you know therapy is about fixing people. Um, but the catalyst for me to eventually go for therapy uh, was through a breakup. And then after that through therapy, I realized that a lot of the stuckness that I feel is because of the conditioning that I've had. Whether it's through my upbringing, through education, through the people I meet. And becoming self-aware of that really helped me to break through that mental barrier. I must say that in law school, I have always been anxious. I've always been an anxious person. I had anxiety disorder diagnosed at age 18. And I suppose I have a little bit of fear that the perception of me in school is that I'm that anxious person, <laughs> which I don't think so lah, because I mean, having graduated, I don't think that's how my friends saw me. Um, and, but anxiety and depression, it was very present in law school especially in law school and there were many times where I fell out of tutorials or lectures and my friends very quickly said okay um, let me send you the notes later so everyone knew it and accommodated it uh, having gone to um, psychotherapy I actually wouldn't consider myself as um, someone with anxiety disorder anymore because I don't experience anxiety or panic attacks anymore like I cannot remember what it was like being in law school and having up to seven panic attacks a day. That really does a number on a person and you feel like, what, what's the point of living? Is that how my life is going to always be like? Um, I, think I talked about how I've always been an anxious person, especially in law school, and I kind of had a little bit of fear that that's the perception of me, eh, the anxious person, because I always need lectures, like, tutorial halfway, and then people you know, give me notes, which is really sweet. Like. That's a very different perception from what I had. Remember, you always used to be uh, show yourself as a caretaker ah, kind true. Of person, right? Oh, <clears throat> that was anxiety too, oh, a little bit. Yeah. Mine was uh, <laughs> about a feeling of stuckness. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. In law and school, mental so? barriers, like, like I feel like you know, I always try to move forward, but like something seemed hit like, It was not on, It was only after we started talking about therapy persuading me to go for it, <laughs> eventually going for it, and now I realise that, wow, there's so much, I feel like I finally really broken through the mental barrier. Wow, amazing. Yeah. When was the first time you opened up to each other? Describe that moment. I guess maybe it's really the breakup that I had. 
my previous relationship, it was about six years. You know, I've always thought it was quite smooth sailing. We were really happy. We had a PTO planned. Um, we even got engaged. Um, so it felt like nothing was wrong. Like it felt like everything was hunky dory. But it was only after I think sharing up with her, with Jolene, that she is the one who pointed out that you know there are some alarm bells to that to that smoothness, to that uh, smooth sailing kind of relationship. Um, because implicit in that is there was a lack of vulnerability with each other. There were certain things, for example, I felt like I couldn't share with um, my ex. That, say for example, I could share with closer friends like Julian. And so that was, that was nice, but that was I think the first time where I really opened up and opened up to my eyes about what relationships really ought to be about. I remember was at Boat Key, um, I think a Korean or Japanese restaurant and he confided in me about his relationship is what I thought and I could see then why he was square like I described it. Actually, he really has that, um, that want and that desire to take care of people around him. Maybe because of the conditioning in his family, it was very important for him that he was the rock that he remained uh, unfallible, or uh, he remained um, emotionless in, in some ways, right? Because I need to put myself aside to take care of other people. Jie Jie told them that it was your relationship because oh I've always been. <laughs> it was my response too. Oh, really? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my relationship. Oh, because I said I've always been a Malayan, you know? I'm always open and vulnerable, maybe a little bit too much, like oversharing kind, yeah. but still with the right friends, I open up very easily. But when I felt like, it was your relationship where I felt like I really met you and we were vulnerable oh with God. each other. Not that you weren't there for me, you were always there for me. It's just, I met you and I saw you. And I said it's Boat Key, that Korean Japanese restaurant. Remember your Boat birthday? Key, Korean Japanese. Yes, yes. It was exactly <laughs> that, that, that day. Uh. No, well, not that day. I mean, opening up, right? It was. I mean, may not. I don't know whether it's the first time, but it's definitely the the more, one of the more poignant times. We met each other. Yes. We saw each other. No longer square. How has being in the legal industry affected your mental health? Affected my mental health. I mean, hasn't affected me personally. What has affected me is how the industry has affected so many of our peers. We always see. So many of our friends just like toiling at 2 a.m., thinking that working till 10 p.m., 12 a.m. is normal, and being willing to tolerate toxic bosses, toxic management, and that is very sad. I must say that um, the legal industry or legal career, oh, the first two years are extremely difficult and it was when the mental health issues really popped up because when you go out to work in the world oh, there's, there are so many triggers everywhere um, yeah so I, I would say it's not really the fault of the legal industry per se I think I'll probably get that in any other industry when I go out to work uh, yeah it was when all the triggers came out I heard through the gaps of the music friends going to big the first two years were really really difficult huh? for any mm. young lawyer yes. extremely difficult because you must manage your your own triggers when you first go out to the world there are financial concerns there are people yelling at you there are people telling you you are not doing the right thing you are making mistakes which as an overachieving student you've never heard that before or at least not to the extent that it would cost you your livelihood and there's so much pressure on a young person to take care yeah. of that your mental health look like in this chapter of your life? Be specific. I think the most important is to learn to protect my own peace. And one of the ways that I've done that True. is to move out, you know, and um, so that I no longer, when I'm away from the, the environment that produces the triggers in me, it allows me to reflect, have time to reflect, have time to become more self-aware, have time to work on myself, so that when I go out back into the world, which I still do, you know, every day, every other day, it allows me to face those triggers. It's a bit like a test, an experiment. Now, every time I go back to my family home, for example, yeah, I still face those same triggers, but the, the effects have started to wane um, because I've gone through the work. 
I've gone through the, the awareness, it, it, I think it really helps to decrease um, the instinctive reaction to, yeah, to become emotional uh, or to want to fix or to solve problems immediately. That is one of my, my instinctive triggers. Um, and so protecting my peace is important. And that could, that could happen in many, dif many, many different ways, I think. For some people, it may not be possible to move out. So it's about you know, finding that space for yourself. That's one. Number two, I think it's finding, for me, things that I enjoy doing. Find joy. Find joy in life. Um, and those moments when I find joy carry, help me to carry through those other moments where, you know, I mean, where, where, where I have to face people who are a bit down, who might be troubled, who might just need a listening ear. My presence going into the conversation becomes, I think, I feel at least, it becomes a more uplifting kind of a, sort of a presence. I really protect my energy. I defend my energy and my peace and my safety extremely jealously. Meaning, I don't allow my parents to comment on my body. No, I don't. Um, I don't want to be disturbed after six p.m. unless necessary. And of course, I still am collaborative about that. Um, I don't allow treatment to me that I know I don't deserve. I would say, don't speak to me that way. Don't say that about my body. And please let me have my rest. I will come back to you tomorrow refreshed. So I, I only spend my time with people who are safe to be around. It's amazing what happens to you when you don't allow people to poke you anymore. Remember, right? Don't allow people to poke you anymore. So then it's like, eh, this is what safety feels like. I've never felt entire, like, absolute safety before. So I know this one. You, what is it? Uh, Poke, poke, poke until you are so numb. Exactly. <laughs> poke by who? Poke by everyone like, around you. Yeah. Like you get just poked too many times until yeah. you Why don't even feel the burn anymore. What's the poke you receive? It's just, just a little trick. Oh, you mean personally? Yeah. Um, just a little microaggressions, right? Yeah. Sometimes, yeah, microaggressions that you face from your family or you know, people around you. We protect our energy very jealously. I'm defending it. Mm. Do not cause. It's very similar to mine. I say protect my peace, um, your energy. Yes, and jealously, I love that. Jealousy. We have to be, it's not being selfish, I think, it's a... Oh, absolutely yeah, not. Um, oh, what are you most thankful to your partner for? Tell them. For you. I think. I really am very grateful that you have helped me to bring up a more authentic voice in me. To be able to hold space for me to be able to be vulnerable. And that I don't think I can say I share that with anyone else. Uh, and I'm always grateful to you. Yeah, yeah. I must say that I don't hide any part of me to you like, like you've seen my worst already so remember, there was one time I, was, I got stomach flu then my partner was overseas then you and yeah. Dorothy just over, over there sticky fingers eating chicken wings in my home I was yes. crying for the first time I felt like oh my gosh I am sick and I'm alone and I don't actually have my family anymore and at that moment oh, I'm feeling a bit emotional that y'all were my family already like that's the first moment it's like i don't have anyone to lean on and you and dorothy are my family so i say worst moments already shown genuinely and you don't achieve that with many people unconditional love for each other love in a i mean in just a very general sense right romantic relationships like i think you mentioned before can be very conditional but friendships i don't have to be there for you you don't have to be there for me well, but, but i the, want to but we choose to I we choose to. each other as, as best friends and that's one Thank you. It's wonderful. Thank you.